Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this NetPhase seminar today. And we're very glad to have Guillaume as our speaker from uh, Northeastern University in the US. Uh, so it's very nice we have some speaker from the US as, as you know that, for example, all of our organizers are from the Europe. So we are not very well connected to the US network science community yet, but we are getting there. Uh, so today, uh, Guillaume will talk about navigating wastewater civilians at airports with probability generating functions and afterwards. Uh, he will lead an interesting discussion about how to enrich your expertise as an interdisciplinary researcher. So thank you very much. And Guillaume, the time is yours. Thank you very much, Anlin. So I wanted to discuss about this new project that I've been working on for almost now a year. Um, so I wanted to start with the basic with environmental surveillance of infectious disease, which is something that you might or might not be aware of, uh, that is getting a lot of traction recently in terms of how we can better track infectious disease and have some reliable data to inform our models and uh, public health policies as well. So assuming we have some, somebody who gets infected, um, for many disease, what we have is that when people are going are gonna to go and poop, there's going to be some genetic material of the disease in, in, in the, uh, the defecation that can be used. And then uh, when the, the, the wastewater goes to the treatment plant, it can be sampled. And from the sample, it's, we are able to kind of reconstruct and analyze the quantity or the concentration of RNA um, for different types of virus in, in, in the uh, wastewater sample. So the idea, I think one of the big advantages of that is that it's um, completely agnostic to like people do not need to participate in it. It's always um, um, it's agnostic to people's behavior in a way. Um, there is some effect of like rain with uh, like rain that can affect the concentration of um, RNA material and stuff like that. But there's all, there are ways to kind of account for that and kind of like re rescale uh, what you, you, you get as a signal. So um, it's not invasive. Um, there's multiple advantages to that. And like there's a lot of like attention right now in the, in the field to kind of like develop these, these, uh, these, these techniques and use them more in our modeling uh, approach as well. So what I want to talk about is a, a slightly different approach, which is travel-based surveillance system. So the A is very similar in, in a way, if somebody gets infected, again, that, that, that individual might go and travel in a plane and then in the plane might go to the, to the laboratory, depo deposit some genetic material from the disease, there is some genetic material uh, in the plane. The plane goes back to the airport. And if we do a sample of the wastewater from the aircraft, then we are able to get, again, some kind of signal about whether or not someone was infected on the plane. Again, one of the big advantage of that is that, that it is, it is non-invasive. We don't need to enroll people into testing. And that gives us an idea of like the international dissemination of infectious disease. And this gained a lot of traction, especially re recently with COVID. So there's been multiple studies um, in that case, in Australia, but also in the UK, in the US, and Singapore, that I have out of my mind. But like around the world, many many people have kind of look at um, aircraft wastewater surveillance as a new way to kind of like track the importation of COVID variants. And we're trying the idea is to kind of like scale this scale this um, to other diseases as well, and to kind of develop a global aircraft wastewater um, genomic surveillance system for better preparing us for the next pandemic in a, in a way. Um, there are some challenges with developing some kind of global system, not just like in, in specific countries, but all around the world. Um, first, we need to find a way to kind of quantify like the, perfor the performance of such a system. Um, right now, it's been mostly experimental studies looking at like, okay, if we sample a certain fraction of incoming aircraft to a specific countries, this is what we get. But if we scale this to a global system, like what would be the, the, the uh, resulting performance? How can we optimize the system? Where should we place uh, these simple site at different airports to kind of like get the best, the best bank for our bucks? And, and then once we have this signal and we are getting the, the, um, the sample and, and these detection at the airport, like how can we leverage this information, this new data set and the novel data stream to better inform our models and also like to better, better prepare ourselves for um, emerging disease. 
And I think in my mind, the way to kind of answer this question is to build some good rigorous uh, model that kind of encapsulates all of this information into one um, approach. And in our group, we uh, many of our work kind of revolve around this model, this global epidemic and mobility model. model. So we um, have a model of over 3,000 subpopulation that like divide the whole population into over 3,000 subpopulations. Um, in that model, we incorporate all of the traffic from uh, air travel from the OAG. We also incorporate more short range commuting uh, commuting uh, patterns. But and, and with that, we um, we also use age structured contact matrices that aim at um, kind of the, representing the all of the, the potential structure or layer structure of the population, like the school layer, community layer, household layer. Um, and combining all that information that gives us like a good reliable model at a global scale. Now this is fully stochastic and like this uh, this, this require a lot, a lot of computational effort to kind of deploy this model. But I'm going to talk about like an alternative approach that we've been developing as well um, for that. So to model um, this kind of system we use in that is this very simple approach where we have like this SLDR type of compartmental model. So we have susceptible, latent, uh, individual, which are not yet infectious. We have this detectable compartment, which uh, in that case encapsulate all infectious individual, but also what, what we consider post-infectious individual, which are not contagious anymore. But if they would be traveling, they would still deposit some genetic material. So you can be detected later after being uh, after you're no longer contagious. And so we have like this kind of meta compartment that uh, tries to encapsulate that. And then we have, of course, the recovered individual. And the idea is that if we have different subpopulation, uh, individuals get uh, infected in the subpopulation and then travel. Um, if there is a Sentinel airport, so if there's a, a surveillance site at a, a particular airport, um, there's gonna be a, a certain probability of detection that is gonna be greater than zero at that, at that location. Now there's many assumptions that we need to do in order to kind of like come up with some model of wastewater surveillance at the airport. So I'm just gonna list down a few in terms of like the sampling procedure, for instance. In that case, we are assuming that we are kind of only sampling international flights to look at the international uh, dissemination of infectious disease. We're gonna sample a certain fraction of all incoming flights. Like it, it can be challenging and costly to sample all, all of the flights incoming to an airport. Um, and then in this last assumption is more of a modeling assumption. We're gonna assume that we're only able to get one detection per day uh, for each of the Sentinel airport. And the, the rationale behind that is um, if we do, in the end, most of the time, even if you're sampling individual aircraft independently, um, if there's multiple individuals that are infected in that aircraft, you're only gonna get maybe one detection. There, there are ways to maybe try and assess maybe how many people were infected on the plane based on the concentration. But these are not very, very precise in a way. So as a kind of just for the sake of simplicity, we assume that if we have multiple aircraft coming into one airport, and even though there might be more than one individual that is infected or detectable by, by the system, we're going to assume it's only possible to get one detection at most. Um, now, there are real heroes out there that, that do the, the, the work that I wouldn't like to be able to do, but like the, there are people that have come up with some estimate of like what is because you need to assess to, to assess this property detection you need to assess how many people go to the lavatory on long haul flight um so there's people that have done this survey asking people like okay what how frequently do you go to the to the bathroom when you're on an airplane depending on the on the on the the the, the length of the flight and, and so forth and so far like there's been a, a number circulating around which is about 16 percent in terms of uh, property of going to the laboratory and then also given that an individual is, is infected or post-infectious in a way, what is the problem that it, it's gonna shed the virus in us so that it's gonna be detectable by, by the bathroom. In the end, when, when we take all of these properties together, um, this gives us a, a number of around 16% for the property of detection. But in the end, in our study, we've also scanned different types of values just to account for uh, the, the possibility of not sampling all of the flight, but, but only a certain fraction of the flights or just in terms of sensitivity analysis as well. 
So this is kind of the overall mechanistic framework to how we can try and model wastewater surveillance at airport. Um, as I said earlier, if we design this and just run simulation, it's going to be very cost costly, especially if we want to consider different past potential origin for an epidemic. Um, so instead, we've been relying on this probability generating function approach. And I'm going to just go at a very high level describing what we're doing here. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but if you're more interested, I, I'm going to give you some link to some potential uh, material that we're kind, of, we're kind of building to make this more readily accessible and understandable. So first, like just going to basic, like what is a generating function? And I think I, I like to explain this in, in, in my way, like how I think about a generating function. In the end, it is a way to encode a sequence of numbers. So it could be, for instance, the Fibonacci sequence, if you're interested in that, or any kind of time series. Um, in our case, we're going to be, be caring more about um, cases and stuff like that. But in a way, generating function is, is just a way to encode the sequence of number. And it could be in, a, in an array. It could be in some kind of uh, tree structure for sets. Or um, in a way, you we could try and encode this into a generating function. So you would attach numbers directly to powers of some dummy variable x. In that case, it doesn't, doesn't have any meaning. It's just a dummy variable to which we are going to attach the numbers. And um, what, what is the quantity of interest is going to be the power of that um, dummy variable. So in, if we are looking at cases number, this would be the case number that we would put on the exponent. Um, and when we're thinking about probability generating function, what we are trying to encode, the numbers that we want to encode and put next to these powers of x is going to be a probability distribution. So I just want to give like a, a very simple example in, 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 in case, for instance, that you would be interested in the role of a die. Uh, what is the associated generating function? Well, it's only going to be 1 over 6 for the probability to have a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4. So you would encode this like this. So you would have like a power of x, you would have a 1 over 6 next to a power of x, 1 over 6 next to the power of x2, so the power to have a, a 2, uh, and so forth up until the power of 6, which is the probability to have um, a 6. Now, um, one question that we could ask is like, OK, taking, and, and I like to, to teach, when, when I teach about generating function, I, I like to kind of like use this example of rolling dice because this is very intuitive. Um, so one question I could ask uh, is, what is the probability distribution associated to the sum of two dice? And then you could do it by n. Like you could take all of the probability to have like one, like what is the probability to have a one as the sum of two dice? It's zero because it's impossible. You're going to have like at least two to one. Um, so it's impossible to have just one as the sum. Um, what is the probability to have two? Well, it's the probability to have one and a one for the two die. Um, and then you can do all of the combinatorics. And it's quite easy. It, it's possible to do it for two dice. But then if I ask you the question, what is the probability distribution associated with the sum of k dice? Um, if you want to do it by n, it's going to be much more challenging. But instead, the idea is that there's a way to kind of encode that into a generating function. In fact, the generating function associated to the probability distribution of k dice has a very simple form. And this is one of the big advantage of uh, generating generating function, especially probability generating function, is when we deal with an independent event, we can combine them in, in a very simple way. One, there's one simple rule, which is that when you sum independent random variable, you just multiply their generating functions. And when you, you look at other types of process that involve some kind of independent random variable, there's all, all these ways to kind of combine generating functions together, which are much simpler than if you were to just deal directly with the property distributions. And it makes a very efficient way to kind of deal um, with this system. So in general, all of these kind of probability generating function approach that you, you can see in network science and epidemiology, usually this kind of boils down to, you have some problem in the probability space, let's say on the left, you have some probability distribution in mind that you want to get, but it's difficult to kind of directly compute. So what you do is you move that to the probability, probability generating function space. Um, and then the, the idea is that usually if you're problem is well posed, um, this generating function is going to be easier to kind of estimate in terms of either a product or some kind of um, more involved. But still, there's, there's going to be a way, an algorithm for you to, to compute that generating function. 
And then you can go back to the product space using a Fourier transform. So there's, the, there's like this loop to kind of uh, design some efficient algorithm based, based on, on probability generating functions. And that's going to give us some very efficient computational approach in the end to, to compute probability distribution of interest. So I know this is very high level, um, but this is just to give you kind of an overview of what we're kind of doing here. So in the case that we're interested in, we are looking at a middle population type of epidemic model. Um, so we have individuals that can infect each other, they can, they can uh, travel. All of these events can be put onto some kind of transmission tree or an event tree of like all of the potential events that could happen. And this, this forms the basis of what we call a multi-type branching process. And this type of process is one typical problem which can be tackled with generating function. So in the end, we can design some sort of recursive algorithm that is going to be able to compute this probability generating functions that we care about um, for these multi-type branching process. And in the end, it's going to be, it's, it's going to allow, allow us to compute distribution that are uh, probability distribution of interest that are much more easier to compute than if we were to just do the simulations directly. Okay, that was a lot of information, very high level, not in the details I know. If you're interested about this type of approach, if you, you like these kind of computational tricks to accelerate your code, um, I encourage you to, to have a look into this. Um, we've been building this um, Jupyter book type of tutorial. So Jupyter book is a way to kind of like get like encapsulate multiple Jupyter notebook into one kind of well-formed book. Um, but then you, it's very interactive. You can uh, you can run the code that, that's embedded in, in the Jupyter book. Um, we think, and I, I really like this more computational approach to generating functions, which usually is more um, theoretical in a way. So I'm kind of like uh, preaching and like, uh, asking people to, to have a look at this and like if they, they are interested in, in this kind of approach, I think looking at into this into from, from a more computational perspective is uh, very interesting. So I'm just going to leave this. If you're interested, the, here's the, the URL. You can scan it with your phone. I'm going to take a, a sip of coffee in the meantime. And um, if you have any other questions with, with respect to, uh, to that, just ask me at the end as well. All right, so now that we have this modeling approach, we also have a very computationally efficient way to kind of calculate some distribution with respect to our model. Now we're going to, I'm just going to show you a few of the results that we've obtained so far um, with respect to the performance analysis of a global wastewater surveillance uh, system at airports. So at first we need to, and also just as some kind of first step, we need to define a Sentinel system. So we need to select a few airports that we, are, we assume are going to do some um, sampling of a potential disease. Um, always in that case, we always have kind of like a COVID or COVID variant in mind, but it could be applied to other respiratory viruses, but also like at large to other types of disease. So at first, we, we've chosen kind of this set of 20 Sentinel. We've kind of chosen them as a way to have a very broad geographical dispersion. So we've chosen like three Sentinel per each WHO region. And we've also added one in South America and one in Australia to have kind of a, some kind of global coverage because you can think of, you need, if you want to detect um, outbreaks that, would, that could start from anywhere, you would want to have some Sentinel system that is not too far in a way um, as some kind of proxy because there's, there are some very long old flight that goes around the world, but like usually uh, there's more of these um, short or short distance flight. Okay. So to analyze the and kind of evaluate the performance of such system, we are mainly interested in this quantity, this metric that we call the time to first detection. So what we care about is if we start an, if an epidemic, well, if we start, hopefully we don't, but uh, if an epidemic would emerge um, from anywhere in the world in different cities, what is the distribution associated to the time to obtain a first detection within our global system? So at any of these sent Sentinel surveillance site, we could have a detection and we, we, we want to know like when are we going to get like a first detection? So in that case, we, we've 
chosen some specific parameter for the disease, some reproduction number of two, um, generation time of four. So the generation time is the time between the time that I get infected and the time that I will infect some other individual. And the uh, detection period, like how long can I be detected because I'm either infectious or still in that post-infectious stage of the disease. Um, we've chosen parameter of 12 days. In the end, and I, and I think I'm going to show a, a little bit of that later, like changing the parameter of the disease does not affect much our conclusion. It's all kind of just rescaling um, the distributions that we get. Um, so if we look at the, this distribution for the time to first detections for different origin, we see that it's going to vary from like, I don't know, 15, 20 days if an epidemic would start in Geneva, it would be detected quite early. Versus if it would, would start from somewhere in Africa, in Kalemi, for instance, it would take up to 80 days to get a detection. But if we look at the shape, all of these distributions are kind of well-defined and their standard deviation is very similar to one another. So we're going to focus on, uh, on the mean time to first detection. That is kind of going to be our metric of interest for each potential origin. So the mean time to get a first detection if an outbreak started in that location. And now we can repeat that process for all potential subpopulation in the world considered in our model. So we have, again, I repeat like 3,000 uh, potential subpopulation. We calculate the distribution for the, the, the time to first detection, and we just like report the mean in, in, this, um, in, the, in this map. So what we can see is that it is very heterogeneous. Like we have some places in Europe, in Europe in general, between 15, 20 days, we're going to get a first detection. Uh, but we have places in, in Middle Africa, for instance, that's going to take like 80 to 100 days to get a first detection. So these, like the scale of our distribution is what we call kind of the blind spot of such wastewater surveillance system. Um, even though we would like the system to be super efficient everywhere, we, we see that like we need probably other surveillance system to palliate that because in some region, like there's not that much uh, volume of air travel. So in the end, it's going to be very long to have a first detection of a case if we only rely on travel-based surveillance. So from this, we can add, I think there's two questions that comes to my mind first. Um, so the, the, these questions are like, how the disease characteristic is going to affect this time to first detection for all of these uh, population? Um, and well, also what about the choice and the number of sentinel that, we, that we've chosen? I'm just going to mute myself for a brief second. Sorry about that, have I called? Okay, so these are kind of the two questions and, and the choice and the number of sentinel boils down to also a, another sub question that we could ask is how can we best optimize our, sy our system to kind of minimize the time to first detections from all of these um, regions? Oh, I'm seeing questions in the chat. Okay. All right. So if we change the properties of the disease, so what I'm showing here in this case is the distribution for the, the time to first detections from everywhere in the world. So all of these like spots with the different colors, we, we gathered that into a distribution. Um, so when we vary the reproduction number, for instance, diminishing the reproduction number, what it's going to do is, is that the, it's going to increase the time to first detection in general, and it's going to broaden the distribution. Um, same thing happened if we instead increase the generation time, we're going to increase the time to first detection, and it's going to broaden the distribution. If we change the detection rate at the airport, so like if you remember this, we had this like 16% potentially kind of number in mind for the, the, the detection rate, but we see that it doesn't affect that much the time to first detection. And the underlying idea is that we have an epidemic that is grow growing exponentially. So, and when we are going to have this kind of first detection, it's, it's going to happen because we're going to have some critical mass of individual um, that are detectable and that are traveling in the system. And since we have this uh, epidemic that is growing exponentially, we're essentially, we're going to, if we are doubling the, uh, if we are diminishing by two, the factor for the detection rate, um, in the end, it's only going to slow down the detection by some by one doubling time of the epidemic. So in the end, like the, the biggest impact 
that the, that that's going to have on the time to first detection is going to be the changing the, the the disease transmission properties such that we're going to change this doubling time, which which kind of change this like the speed at which the disease is is going to is going to propagate. So like if we think back in terms of doubling time, um, diminishing the reproduction number is going to be the same as increasing the doubling time. If we are increasing the generation time, it's going to be the same as uh, increasing the the doubling time. Um, and then like the, the impact of the uh, changing the detection rate is just only going to change like the critical mass that we need to obtain a first detection. Now, if we look at this time to first detection, and in that case, I'm only showing the median and the interquartile range of the distributions. Um, so if we are increasing this doubling time, we're going to see an increase, a, a pretty steady increase for the time to first detection. But in the end, what we can do is we can always just rescale this by the doubling time and also accounting for some factor that, that this log two term that is uh, only to account for the stochasticity of the uptake process. But in the end, we're mainly just rescaling by the doubling time and we obtain some time to first detection that is just like pretty, pretty much constant. So in the end, if we go back to this picture, if we were to increase or decrease doubling time by changing the disease characteristic, in a way, we would just broaden and shift this distribution in some ways. But in the end, like the overall picture, the heterogeneity that we observe would still remain the same. We're kind of just rescaling the properties of this uh, of this system. Now, that, that that's encouraging because in the end, if if we are only rescaling by some factor, um, the time to first detection, that means that this time to first detection for any specific parameter that we choose is going to be a good objective functions if we try to do some optimization. And, and, it, and this is essentially what we did. So we, we look at um, this mean time to first detections where we average over all potential origin. And, and we define this as some kind of opt objective function for our optimization problem. And then we can try and see, can we find some better set of Sentinel? Can, you, can we find some better uh, airports so that we have a, a minimal time to first detection um, overall in our, in our system? And what we're going to do, we're going to report, report this in terms of excess time to first detection. So we're, we're going to define, uh, we're, we're going to compare this mean average time to first detection from all origin with um, an, an, ideal, an idealized system where we would put a sentinel in every airport in the world. So if we put a sentinel in every airport in the world, it's going to give us essentially the, the, the minimal or the optimal um, system that we could get. And we're going to compare like the result we get for a particular set of Sentinel compared to this like optimal or idealized system. And in a way, this gives us like the percentage of excess time it would take us to detect first case with our specific system. Now, we, we tried different types of optimization strategy. I'm just going to show you one of them, which is kind of a, a greedy optimization. So assuming we start and like in all of the cases, we, we've seen that London is a very good uh, Sentinel system in our in all of the case. So if we start with the, with the Sentinel first in London, and now we want to add more and more Sentinel to the system, what we're going to do is we're always going to try and minimize this objective function at each step of the optimization procedure. If we do that, like the, the next Sentinel that we, we see that would be a, a good place is Hong Kong, gives us a good coverage. In that case, like the, the darker the spots, it, it, it shows how much we reduce the time to first detections if an outbreak started in these locations. So in that case, we see that if we put a Sentinel in Hong Kong, it's going to give us a lot of like coverage in terms of China, but also like a, a lot of place in Asia as well. Now, if we add a Sentinel in that case in Paris, we're going to get some more coverage of a little bit in South America, but like mostly in Africa, also Madagascar. Um, in Dubai, this is going to give us a lot of coverage in terms in, in Russia, in, in, in Asia, and in Africa as well. So we, we add more and more of these Sentinel, and we see where like this Sentinel is kind of improving our detection. In that case, uh, I think this is Miami. Um, this gives us a better coverage of South America and so forth. Like we, we add more and more Sentinel to the system. And what we've seen is that when we do this for different types of strategies, like we've compared also with uh, just choosing airport according to their volume of international travel, also the between the centrality of the uh, of the air travel network. Uh, in the end, they all provide similar performance in a way. Uh, we we see, and this is not something that I'm showing here, but that we've seen that the greedy strategy is, is most useful when we try to do some more targeted optimization. So if we 
assume that an epidemic would start from some sub-region in the world, then we can optimize for that sub-region and then like the greedy approach is much better. But the result I wanted to show here in that case is that if we use this system, we see that even with about 20 Sentinel in the world, we have about 80% of the capacity of an idealized system. So the excess time to first detection is about 20%. So we can shift the percentage back to like a, from flip, flip this around. And we see that only with 20 Sentinel, we would have about 80% of the full capacity. So there is some clear diminishing return, which is interesting. Like th that means that we don't need to have like a Sentinel in every airport in the world if we want to have a very efficient system with as little, which can be, which can seem still a big number, but that, with as little as 20 Sentinel, we already have some good coverage um, of the whole world with, with this type of system. And finally, we did some, some counterfactual studies to kind of like show um, how useful this system could have been at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we assumed that what could have happened if we had such a surveillance system at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, how it could have been useful for us in terms of situational awareness and preparedness for the, the pandemic. So what we did is first we calibrated our, our model on what we have observed. So the international importation of cases that have been reported at the beginning of the pandemic. So with that, we were able to kind of calibrate the, the both the reproduction number, but also the start some potential start date for the epidemic. Now we inject this information into our model, and from that we we um, we look at what would what could have, what we could have done if we had this um, surveillance system at the airport. So we look at the time or the date that which we could have had a first detection with that system if um, it was operational at the time. And with varying varying detection rate here on the left uh, on on the right again like we we can go back to the sixteen percent magic number maybe in terms of potential realistic detection rate that we could have had, um, and we see that we would have had a detection probably much earlier than the first international case that were, was reported. So the first case that was reported outside of China was on January thirteen. So I'm showing the everything that is on the left on the left of the orange part corresponds to the probability to have a detection before this. Um, so depending on the detection rate, we could have had a detection much earlier. This would have given us a, a better idea of like the, the international dissemination of COVID much earlier than, um, than than we first detected the case. So that's very encouraging in terms of the situational awareness capacity of such a thing. And we've done also some other studies in terms of like what, we, once we have the system in place and we start to also get some, some detections, how can we use these case detection to inform us on the pandemic potential of a, of a disease? So in that case, we've, we've done some CITIC synthetic simulation. So we again, from the calibration that we that we add, we can um, generate some simulation and look at potential time series of detections at the airport that we could have gotten with um, a surveillance system at the airport. And from that, from that, we can do two things. For instance, we can first look at geo, the, the geolocalization of an outbreak. So like, if we don't know the origin, like in the case of COVID, we pretty early on, we had an idea that there was something happening in China, but like there could be some um, new disease or new COVID variant that emerged and, and it would be much much less clear from where the, uh, the epidemic or, originates from. And we see that as little as five to 10 detections, we, we start to have a good idea of where the epidemic must have originated from. Um, what we also did is look at as soon as we get a, a few a few detections, how, what what can we say about the properties of the disease in terms of reproduction number, which is like the one one very important number to, to kind of pinpoint the uh, the infectiousness of a disease. And in that case, like if we were to again assume that we would be able to accumulate detections up until January twenty three at the beginning of COVID, so January 23, 2020. Um, with these cases we would, have, we would have gathered, we would have had some very good estimation of both the reproduction number, but also about when the epidemic started. So that would have been very useful in terms of situational awareness at the time. Uh, and so we were very optimistic that such system would help us better prepare for the next pandemic. So broad overview of what I've discussed. Um, so we've been doing this kind of performance evaluation of what a global wastewater surveillance system at the airports could look like. Um, and try and better kind of pinpoint the advantage of such system. We've been able to show that like there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of time to first detection. So 
although this is a very interesting system, there might be some blind spot that would need to be covered by other surveillance systems that do not rely on um, travel or air travel. We've seen that like the properties of the disease are going to affect a lot like this time to first detection, but in a predictable way such that we can always kind of rescale by the doubling time. And it's not going to matter when we do the optimization of the system. And with about, let's say, 20 Sentinel, we are already at 80% of the capacity. So we don't need to have like a very extensive system to have some good detection capabilities. And we've been showing how we can use, how it could have been useful at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and hopefully how we can um, leverage that in the next uh, outbreaks that are going to emerge and be able to characterize the growth of, of such disease. So that's that's it for my research part. I just want to shout out to... We, to um, to our Boston campus. We are hiring right now at, at the MOBS lab uh, in Boston with a, so this would be to work with Alex Vespignani. Um, so I'm just gonna let this a few seconds if you're interested. We have a beautiful city, a beautiful center. I don't know if you, you've you all visited maybe the Network Science Institute, but this is a very great environment, uh, interdisciplinary environment to do some projects. And um, yeah, we, we, we've received some new um, grant recently with the CDC or the, the CFA, which is a branch of the CDC. And so we're hiring at all level, like postdoc, research scientist, principal research scientist. Um, so if you are interested, reach out to me or you can look at the uh, the job ad. We are also hiring in Maine. So like, as you might know, like network science is very, ex is expanding in different directions. We have a campus in London for the Network Science Institute. There's also a campus in Maine, uh, beautiful city of Maine, uh, uh, of Portland in Maine. Um, so again, hiring at different level, research faculty, postdoc level, PhD students. Um, if you know people that are interested or if you're interested, I encourage you to uh, scan this and uh, or reach out to me. So of course, like this project is not a single person endeavor. Like this has been done with, in collaboration with many people. Um, I want to thank them and there's a preprint that should come soon about this. I've been promising a preprint for at least a year now, but like this is really true. I think like within the next few weeks, we are very hopeful to release a preprint of this subject. Uh, please do reach out to me if you have any more questions. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting talk. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Just feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, there is a comment in the chat from Sylvia. Uh, I suppose oh, yeah. it's problematic also because the blind spots seem to be clustered together in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Like there's, in the end, we see that even if we try to break down at different ge geographical level, what we're going to see is there's, there's going to be a blind spot in all the regions. So there, there are always going to be some blind spot. But of course, like uh, if you look at uh, Middle Africa, Central Africa, um there's a huge blind spot there in the end the fact that they are clustered there might be an advantage i don't know like because in the end we can try and tally this blind spot with other types of um, environmental surveillance um in fact we are collaborating with the, the gates foundation to kind of like deploy the, this kind of system and and once we've shown we've shown them like this map they were they were like okay well we can try and already think about how we can tally these blind spots and find some other ways to kind of uh, do surveillance there so that we don't, yeah, leave any any kind of region as uh, undetected in a way. And yeah, we in terms of optimization, we could also and and this is something like many people, <laughs> since I've presented that uh, in different places, like I've received this comment a lot, like oh why why don't you just do the optimization on, on the blind spot and and this is something we definitely need to do um, to, to to do like we haven't done it yet and that's a very good suggestion. In the end, what we see what we've seen other. Uh, Though, like, is um, even if we were to put a sentinel in every airport in the world, there's still going to be some blind spot. And this is just to the fact that there is some um, place such that the, the traffic, the air travel, the, the air travel traffic is so low, that's going to be very difficult to get like the disease out of these places before. So in the end, um, we really need to rely on other types of approach to kind of palliate for these blind spots. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Can I ask one? Although I'm, I'm squatting this space. Of course, so of course. 
is for early early career so i didn't want to but i couldn't uh, i couldn't resist to come to this talk um so uh, very 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 nice work i mean i i knew about about it uh, since a couple of months uh, and my question are actually two so one is uh, i mean what is the role of stochasticity in all of this and how you capture it mm -hmm. yeah. And the second one, if I may, is that I mean, I understand the time using the time to detection as a, as the the key uh, metric, but I mean, being ten days in delay, let's say, if the disease starts in some place in Africa or if the disease starts in London, is very different. Mm -hmm. The outcome, let's say, of the number of cases after I don't know, hundred days. So uh, yep. I wonder if you ever if you thought about to renormalize by the know the, the cost in terms of uh, I don't know recover people after uh, X number of days rather than the time. Yeah, that's a good, that, that's a very good point. Like, uh, and this is something that we looked, especially at the beginning, like when we were first looking at this, we were not looking especially at the time, but more at like the, the when we first get a detection, what is the actual outbreaks as of the time? Um, this is still something that I need to do, but I, my guess is that when we do this renorm renormalization of the time to first detection with the doubling time, we should arrive at something that is in a way, it should be a good proxy for the outbreak size, either at the source or in the world at that time as well. Um, I would say one reason why we focus on the time to first detection is it's much easier for me to compute in terms of like computational e efficiency like this run yes. on my computer, on my laptop really, really efficiently. The other one, it can I can still do it, a little, but it's a little bit more complicated in a way. Um, but yeah, we, we want to look at these other targets as well because yeah, like in the end, what we mostly care about is like how many people are infected currently right now and are, are potentially carrier of the disease and can create more. Um, ideally, and I'm pretty sure this is the case, like this time should be a good proxy. In terms of the stochasticity, um, in the end, the stochasticity plays, um, the major role it plays is in terms of the detection process. And this is why like the, time, the, 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 the distribution for the time prediction always have kind of the same shape. Um, there's also stochasticity in terms of um, the beginning of the outbreak. If we start with only five infected individuals, it's going to stutter for some while and, and, and it's going to create a lot of stochasticity. In the end, we, we usually assume that we start with a cluster of at least 10 infected individuals to kind of reduce the stochasticity. Um, and in the end, it doesn't play a major role. So if you always assume that your, your epidemic starts with a cluster of 10, 20 individuals, this kind of initial stochasticity doesn't matter that much. And it's mostly kind of the um, stochasticity associated with the de detection process that is going to affect your, your distribution. But in the end, this stochasticity, like it's always kind of a well peaked distribution that is very much the same in all of the cases. So we kind of ignore that part in a way. And we kind of rely mostly on the mean time to first detection as, as a metric. And this gives us a global perspective, even though all of these kind of data point are more like small distribution around like a, a mean value. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question myself. Uh, sure. it's, a, 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 it's a detail of the optimization. So if you can go back a few slides. So if I understand correctly, the optimization, the objective is to minimize the average detective time for all this airport. That's right. I don't remember exactly if you can go back a few. Yeah. Oh, is it this slide? Um, this one? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. The, no. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Yeah. So we are um, minimizing the, the uh, we are averaging over. So we have, there's kind of two average there. There's kind of two mean. There's for each, each potential origin. So like each of these points, we have a mean time to first detection. So each of these subpopulation that gives us one mean time for detection. Okay. After that, we, we average this over all potential subpopulation to give us like an average of the mean time for detection over all population. Now, in that case, I'm, I'm using, assuming that all subpopulation have equal weight, which is one big assumption. Like we might want to bias this in some ways. Um, okay. There are some maps that have been created in terms of um, potential for epidemic spillover. For instance, so if we're interested in interested in detecting novel pathogen, that might be interesting to look at these map of epidemic spillover potential. Um, we could also think of just like, for instance, circulating COVID variant. We could look at maybe incidence data and try to bias our distribution in terms of this. Um, 
So there's, and, and in a way, this would be very flexible. We could just input some prior policy distribution for each of these subpopulation and, and inject that into our objective function, which is the mean. Um, uh, okay. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested, actually, the, the, the method you do this optimization because you're actually optimizing over a set yeah. of uh, like discrete variables, right? You're choosing yeah. Yeah. some from the whole set. So yeah. uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how do you do this exactly? Yeah, that, because, uh, you are doing over yeah, discrete yeah. variables and it's not, uh, you know, like a differentiable. No, it's not trivial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a combinatorial optimization, optimization problem. Like you, you're asking, for instance, like if I want to find the, the, 20, the 20 best Sentinel system, like you would technically need to try all of the potential combination, which is not feasible on a computer. So what we do is a greedy approach. In the end, what we can do is, for us, kind of calculating this quantity, this objective function is very cheap. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is we do it sequ sequentially. So this greedy type of approach is that what you're going to do is, is at each step of the process, you, you add one more sentinel, and you're going to choose the sentinel that minimizes this objective function. Yeah, so, so when you so choose when I... one, how do you choose one? You test all of them one by one, and you yeah. choose, oh, OK, OK. Exactly. You, you recalculate, and, and that part is not, uh, I think it's the way I'm doing it, I'm kind of doing some approximation to to kind of get this objective function very efficiently for all of the potential origin. But in the end, like this, this is super fast to just recompute for all of the potential origin, you, you recompute. If I add the Sentinel there, how much reduction do I have in time to freeze detection? Okay. So in that case, like the, this um, purple color that we see is this, um, difference in time of mean time to first detection for each of these subpopulation. Mm -hmm. So for, for each of the pot potential sentinel, you, you recalculate it, you choose the best, you put it there, and then you, you repeat the next one. So you choose the next one, the next best one. Um, okay. And in, in the end, like even though you have to recalculate things for like 3,000 potential or 2,000 ish uh, potential airports. This this runs really fast. Like this is this takes a couple of seconds to 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 get a new set. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. And in yeah. the chat, and again, we uh, okay. the, I, I I just learned like a, some collaborator like sent me like we have just learned that this objective function is um, would have properties that is called submodular. I don't know if some people have heard about that, but in that case, we know that there are some guarantees for the performance of a greedy approach. Like. These are very loose bounds, so it doesn't give us like a good idea of like how close you are to the the true optimum. But in the end, usually when you have a submodular objective function, a greedy approach is going to be very very efficient, and in the end, um, give you something that is very close to the true optimal, even though you you cannot verify that <laughs> in a way. Okay, uh, in the chat there's just one comment. Uh, Preprint of the paper. You said you you'll, you'll come out in a few. No. Right? In a few weeks, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I'm always seeing this, but like I think this is true now. Like we're kind of doing the final iterations on um, trying to, like, we need to convey this. And like I'm, I'm a physicist by background, and like for me, I've, I've been always trained into making these more technical paper. And now we're very trying to convey and um, translate that for physician and people in, in the public health sector. So it's a, uh, it's taking a, a long time to kind of do this mental switch. But um, in the end, I, I, I I'm. I'm hopeful that within a few weeks, we're going to have uh, an initial product. OK, thank you. So if there's no more questions, I think we should go to the second part of the seminar. Sure. So this is going to be very informal. Like, uh, I think I've laid, this is not very clear. Also, like, this is very fuzzy in my mind now. I kind of like thought about this discussion. Um, so it's more of an amalgam of many ideas, thought reflection that I had during my PhD. And I just want to share them with you. And then we can I don't know, discuss if this applies to you and what, what, what you think about that. Um, so I think one of the things that I, I remember, like when I started my PhD uh, in, in physics, like I, even though we were a very theoretical group in a way, I was always kind of finding myself not an expert in this, in this subject. Like I remember when I first encountered like these critical exponent for um, statistical physics process. I, I, I never had a proper training in, in critical phenomena in a way. And um, 
trying to learn like an, on top of everything, like to learn like this subject was always kind of challenging because you're like, you feel like you've not, you've not received kind of some proper training that you need, but in the end, you're kind of touching many subjects that kind of requires a, a lot of specific knowledge. So I, I found it very challenging at the beginning to kind of like slowly kind of expand my expertise. Um, and I don't know if this is a feeling that other people have had, uh, but yeah, in, in a way, I, I, and, and I try to, I've had many discussions with my supervisors and collaborators at the time to kind of like, yeah, like try to better understand how to deal with this and also like um, how to manage these projects in a way to kind of like slowly but surely accumulate more knowledge and develop your expertise. Because you see, like when you're in internet network science, you, you see these people like like Nicola who is uh, <laughs> assisting today, but like these, uh, these people who are at a very, um, I don't know, this pioneer of network science that have like knowledge in many, many fields that are experimented in many fields. And you're like, how can I, how can I reach this point at some point? Like, how can I slowly accumulate knowledge so that I, I'm becoming truly an inter interdisciplinary researcher? And through this discussion, I, I found that like, you really need to treat kind of like your project as some kind of portfolio. And that's a good advice that I received from Laurent. Um, and I, I think it's good sometimes to have like, a, sometimes we try, we always try to reach very high in terms of like the in, potential impact of a project. I think sometimes it's, it's, it's fine and it's fair to just have some very small side project that you don't know if it's going to be a big contribution to the field, but it's just a project that is important to you. And in some, sometimes it allows you to be more flexible in terms of like, oh, I'm going to take some time to explore other fields with that little project, this little pet project. And in the end, like this, this I think this, for me, this, this has been a, a way that I've learned a lot uh, through these small kind of experimental project. Um, I always, yeah, like this kind of this idea or this concept of or this metaphor of a portfolio of project. I like to think of this as like, okay, what is the potential impact versus the time or effort that I'm going to put into a project? And I think it's good to have, as your financial advisor would say, it's good to have some diversity in your portfolio. Um, so not putting all of your eggs in the, in the same basket. So not just doing some very big impactful project that are going to take so much of your time and it's going to take you a lot of energy. Sometimes having some of these more small, um, fun projects that are, in in a, in, a, in a way like low risk, uh, that you know you can you can put this uh, you can go to the end with this project and it's gonna be fun. You're gonna learn and and, and that's it. Um, going still again in this metaphor of portfolio of projects, like I, I like I think like there's also always this dichotomy of exploration versus exploitation, and I think it's good to do both. Like in my uh, PG, I've done a lot of work on like approximate master equation of epidemic. Like it's very like a very specific subfield, and I've worked almost exclusively on that. And I think it's it's good. Sometimes you need to like develop some very deep, profound knowledge in some very specific field to kind of exploit and like get everything you can from that. But at some point, you also need to do this kind of more explor exploratory process and um, try to get into get involved into a project that are just a little bit outside of your um, expertise or your your comfort zone so that you can develop some new knowledge and like this kind of level of how far it can be outside of your comfort comf comfort zone in a way is up to you uh, in in my experience i prefer to have something that is still close to the boundary of my comfort zone because otherwise like you don't feel like you're able to contribute enough or it's going to be very challenging and uh, again like a very energy consuming to kind of like pursue this project um, so yeah, like maybe in terms of like another takeaway of this is like striking a balance between exploration and exploitation um, and finding like what is the, the good comfort zone for you to these new exploratory step. And I think the best way for me has been to, to kind of explore in a goal-oriented way. So whenever I, I had some subject that I was interested in, I was like, oh, I'd like to learn more about this subject. Find some project that kind of encapsulate this idea or new concept that you want to explore. And like start this project and, and, and pursue this project. This is the best way to kind of learn, I think, in, the, in this in this interdisciplinary environment. You can always just read a book, like get, get a new book on a subject and read it. But I don't think it's the most productive way to kind of learn. Um, depends on how you, you 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 like just like reading a book from from cover to cover. But like for me, I, I get bored really easily. So like it, it was always better to kind of like form, force myself into a new project that is just at the boundary of my comfort zone so that I can explore new horizons. And I just want to give you maybe the, like one example of that. Um, so I was saying, uh, as I was saying, like my 
at, at the beginning of my PhD, I was much in, into like theoretical, statistical, statistical physics. Um, I was looking at these critical exponents and like finite size scaling analysis of um, epidemic model and like trying to find ways to kind of like get to the nitty gritty detail of these epidemic threshold. And um, I did this, like my first project was around that. And what I found is that it takes so long to kind of compute all of this. So I think this was kind of the, the first time that I was, okay, I need to learn more about computer science. I need to learn better ways to code, better ways to kind of like design simulation algorithms. So this was kind of my wake up call for that. And I was like, okay, let's let's start a project on that. Like let, let, let's find a way to to better kind of simulate um, contagion network. And I, I I went back to, oh yeah, <laughs> make stochastic simulations fast again. Um, so the idea was to go back to the source and like go back to, okay, what, what is the algorithm I'm using? I'm using some kind of Gillespie type algorithm. So this is a way to simulate continuous time contagion dynamics or continuous time stochastic processes in general um, on computers. So I'm going to go back to the source, like explore, because th this has emerged from computational chemistry, like uh, the field of um, computational physics and computational chemistry. And there's a lot of great paper in that field. Like I was amazed at how close it is to, to, to many of the, the subjects that I was interested in. Um, I discovered a lot of nice paper while I was doing this kind of exploratory period of in, into the, the world of chemical reaction networks. Um, one, this is just like me being nerdy at that point, but like I, I, I really like this paper where they were showing how to recycle random numbers. So I don't know if you, you probably never, N never went that deep into like your code, but like if you are looking at the, the nitty gritty details of how you simulate your, your contagion, at some point you might end up to a point where generating a random number is going to be the, the bottleneck of your code. And, and that can end up being a costly step. And at that point you can do what's called recycling random number. So when you are generating a random number of your computer, it's going to have some bit of information in terms of like the, in, in terms of the randomness. And Usually we don't need all of this bit of information that is created by the random number generator. So what we can do is we can, re there's a, a trick to kind of recycle some part of the information that you're using from your uh, process. And in a way you're kind of like saving some time in terms of generating a random number from, from that process. But in the end, like that's very like little details, but in the end, like searching through the field, I, I, at some point I was able to find some great paper that was doing exactly what I needed. I just needed to translate this from the simulation of large biochemical reactions to epidemic epidemic process, but in the end, like it was very easy to, for me to translate that from 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 that source to 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 my problem, and in the end, like we kind of wrote down a little a little project around that, like wrote a little paper, and then that, from this, I learned a lot, like immensely in terms of uh, like the the details of computer engineering, um, designing efficient algorithm, and so forth. So just a very simple example. And I think like that that applies, like this idea of like creating these little project, project also applies when you're at the point of choosing maybe a, a, a postdoc position in a way. Um, so for me during my PhD, I learned a lot about like theoretical physics, statistical physics, computer science, like with, through these little kind of experiment, a lot about epidemic modeling, but always in the more theoretical context. So when I chose my postdoc, this was kind of, again, like this micro baby step that you want to, go a little outside of your comfort zone, but still close enough to your comfort zone so that you're still productive. And I think like the, I found a pretty good sweet spot where I am right now. Like we are a lot involved with the public health uh, sector, which is what I, I wanted to have like this contact. Um, so getting closer to the policy making decision, but still like I, I'm able to play with generating functions and very theoretical tools. So I'm able to be being productive, but still like in, in this new environment where, um, I'm learning a lot about like the public health part of, uh, of my work. So yeah, in conclusion, like I think it, it's good to have like this, these goal oriented. And I think when you choose a postdoc or like you're looking for a postdoc, and these are two questions that you should ask yourself, like how can I best contribute to, to this new lab? Um, so like all of your past experience, your comfort zone should overlap with what the lab needs in a way, like that, that would be the ideal case. And also, like, what are you going to learn from this post? Like, if you're too much in the center of your comfort zone, you might, like, you're going to be productive. But in the end, are you going to learn much from that experience? I think, like, the, the best is to find some compromise between the two. Um, and yeah, like, I think, like, a final visualization of, like, what is my in my mind, like, this random walk of academia and learning um, 
in terms of interdisciplinary research, like you, you're doing like these micro step here and there to kind of like evolve. And at some point, I think it's good to stop and like ex exploit what you've learned so far and like deep, do a deep dive into like what you've learned and, and uh, yeah, exploit your comfort zone to kind of produce these more um, impactful research. I think that's it. So Thank you. I've asked you the question, like, have you felt, have you ever felt kind of in that situation? How is your feeling about the, um, Oh, I'm seeing there's a raised N. Inspiring. And uh, clearly there are a few questions. Uh, yeah. So, yes, Sylvia typed in the chat. Uh, the magic about small projects is that they easily become big projects. That's true. The magic about small projects. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and sometimes, yeah, like you, you, you can start with humble ambition. And at some point, you can find some gem and like, oh, wow. Like you, and, and, and sometimes this is also. Um, true discussions. I think another point that I should have mentioned is like, it's it, it can be fun to do a project for yourself and do a project alone. But I think like it's always great to have coll nice collaborators and doing. I, I never do research alone in the end. Like I think it's always best to have these discussions. And sometimes like this is how you can turn a simple, humble project into something much bigger because like someone has some good way to link this to another problem. And yeah, no, yeah, yeah that's a yeah, good uh, good point. And how do you find small projects? I think, yeah, that's a good good question. Like, I think there's no, like, secret recipe for finding them. I think in that case, like, for me, it was just, like, when you have any kind of interest that is at the boundary of your comfort zone, you're like, oh, like, I have a little bit of interest in that. Um, I would like to explore I would like to explore that field, but in a way, I don't have anything right now that I'm able to do. So I, I think, like... Either you can find you, you you can already look in the field and like find some ideas directly from 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 the field, or I think going to conference, like discussing with people, um, trying to get yeah engage with other people from other fields. Um, yeah, that, that that's a difficult task. Like uh, being able to find these small projects that are like at the right position. Uh, I, I don't think I have an answer for that, but uh, hopefully everyone can do it. Yeah. Uh, I think previously there was another question from uh, Lisa. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the for the talk. Very interesting, and I I think uh, it's more a comment than a than a question. I think sometimes it, what it means is like a bit of risk. I mean, willingness mm -hmm. to take a risk. Also, for, maybe from the from the surrounding, we are not so encouraged to take some risk to do some project on our own because. You know, you have to finish your PhD. You have to do that, that, that. So, so maybe, yeah, there should be more, more culture on taking risk, even in early, in the early stage of your research. I mean, it's, I think it's a good thing. You learn a lot from from that. I know. Yeah, I totally agree. That that that's a very good point. I think. For me, for instance, I think during my PhD, I didn't take that much risk. Like all of the things that I've done were. Looking back, like I, I can I can criticize my own PG, I think, and I, I look at my my PG and I'm like, oh, like all of these projects were pretty much in my comfort zone or the comfort zone at least of my lab advisor and everything. Um, I see some of my other colleagues that are taking more risk, and I think yeah, it, it is beneficial and um, yeah, it's difficult. It's a difficult decision because when you're taking some risk, usually it's because you're taking, you're going to try and do something that is very out of everybody's comfort zone in a way um it's uh it can be mentally challenging as well i think this is why also having multiple projects at some point becomes useful because there's always kind of a plan b or there's always another project that you can work on so having this kind of portfolio i like to think of this as like some kind of like finance thing but like you you have this portfolio of projects where you have some more risky and some less risky project and in the end it's finding a good balance between them um because with risk comes the, the possibility that you're gonna spend a lot of time on your project and there might not be some good outcome at the end. So like it's going to be very challenging mentally. And uh, so, yeah, having a balance between those, um, again, there's no kind of like recipe for all for this, but like just being aware that, okay, maybe looking back at, at your project and like, oh, is this a risky project? Should I find some other project to kind of balance this out and have some you know, more small, smaller pit project that I, that I know that I can achieve and that, in a way, I, I'll be able to to carry uh, up until the end.
any other thing anyone want to add? Yeah, because it's quite already quite late. Uh, so if there's no other questions or comment, uh, let's thank Guillaume again for this wonderful research talk and also for this uh, discussion. Thank you very much thank you. to everyone for joining this seminar. Uh, this will be our last seminar for this semester and uh, we will start next year in January. I don't remember which date, uh, it's 8th or 11th, something like that. Uh, so yeah, I uh, hope to see you at that time as well. And by the way, we are still looking for speakers. So if you know anyone interested in this, just uh, let them know about this. So sure, I'll spread awesome. the word. Thank you very much. And if you know anybody interested in epidemic spreading, like we're again, I'm, I'm just gonna say it again. Like we're looking yeah. for people. Like uh, <laughs> anybody, like uh, send them, send it, send them our way. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.